we weren't expecting this overwhelming turnout. Clearly, we all are overwhelmed. So it's fantastic to see everyone or anyone who's out here. So thank you all for taking time out on a Sunday and coming. A couple of housekeeping announcements before I throw it over to the ever so popular Professor Bhatra here. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second thing is you guys have been put on each side specifically and you have your cards in front of you. Those are supposed to show your support during the debate. And if you guys want to flip your sides, they're double sided by the way. So you can just leave them as you're going along the way. Keep it rolling, right? And uh, the last thing, of course, uh, do we have a structure chapter in here? Because we need hashtag, hashtag, and hashtag. Is it really not? We'd appreciate someone to take over his mantle and actually do it. Yeah, I'm sure he'll do it from there. So, uh, over to uh, Thank you for everybody for being here on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, I'm really losing track of time. Uh, this is the ISC Leadership Debate, and it's one of the many events that's going to kickstart the flagship event, which is the ISC Leadership Summit. The ISC Leadership Summit actually has been going on for close to a decade now, and this year's theme is the future today. As you see at ILS in the next couple of weeks, you'll see more than 100 different professionals. You'll see 200 corporate delegates, you'll see 800 students, and over 40 industry-wide speakers. As I said, the theme for this year is the future today. So what exactly does that mean? Well, in the 1990s and in the 2000s, there were predictions of us that power is going to move eastward, that these emerging economies, like India, like China, are slowly going to take over the developed economies. What we realized, though, over the last couple of decades is that not all these economies have lived up to these predictions. But perhaps what happened in the last decade was just a blip in the time to occur. Maybe what's going to happen is that the forces are once again going to return and the power eventually will shift eastward. Maybe India, China, and other emerging economies will eventually realize the predictions and the potential that were forecasted in the past decade, maybe even more. In today's debate, we're going to look at a macroeconomic issue that is pertinent to any country, but is particularly relevant to our country, which is one of the most useful nations in the world. What we're going to look at today is what's more important in life. Is it more important, and what drives the passion and growth of a country? Is it making money in this side of GDP, or is it happiness, making sure the citizens of a country in fact are happy? Debating today, the positions for both sides are two of your most popular professors, as I can tell by the Immense turnout in this room. They have a huge fan base. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mani. He's an IAM alumni with a PhD from the University of Chicago. Mr. Mani is a guru of mergers and acquisitions. You can pick up virtually any recent edition of the Economic Times and find Mr. Mani's views on fiscal policy. Put your hands together for Professor Krishna Murthy Subramaniam, who will be speaking in favor of the So on the other side, we have Professor of Marketing, Raj Raghunathan, also known as Mr. Happy. <laughs> also from IIM and a PhD from New York University, Mr. Happy feels that GDP, much like the cassette players of the 1980s, are actually unusable in today's world. Many a days, and in fact some nights, you can find Mr. Happy strumming his guitar and happily singing along. Please give a big round of applause to Professor Raj. I'm not surprised to see such an overwhelming support of Mr. Money. But what I am surprised to see, since it's not a master's of social work, is so many people <laughs> who are actually in favor of happiness. And of course, you have me, your relatively impartial moderator, <laughs> who's much like most of you, somewhere in the middle. I find happiness in ordinary experiences like playing with my kids, 
And I also finally meant to have this on the last day of every month when I used to be credits my salary. <laughs> my bank account. And I feel that's how most of us actually are. So let me briefly tell you about the debate format and what you can expect today. Uh, I'm going to give each of the faculty eight minutes to present their sides and their perspectives on money versus happiness. After that, we're going to have a 15 minute head to head, one on one discussion where you can argue counterpoints against what was said. Finally, we're going to end with a round of questions from the audience where you can ask either or perhaps both of the professors pointed questions that you might have regarding their positions. So uh, we want this debate to actually be engaging and we want it to be interactive as an audience. All of you have uh, cards, they're double sided as um, people will tell you. If you agree with the arguments that are being presented by either of the faculty, please raise your cards up in support of your viewpoint. So let's see what matters more today. Is it being happy? Is it making money? Or maybe the truth is that you can find a way to be happy while making money. So let's, without further ado, put our hands together and get this to be started. With Mr. Money's view, and um, Renal and Sophie, you have eight minutes to convince us about why money matters more than happiness. Thank you very much, Rishi. So, I'm an equations man. I need to state my position right away in the form of an equation money plus value is equal to happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Let me elaborate on that. So what I mean in particular and sort of trying to explain my position, money is something that is absolutely necessary for happiness, but maybe not sufficient. Why do I say it's necessary? Let me just sort of try and convince you with a couple of examples from people whom I actually have been immensely inspired by. One person whom I actually look up to a lot is Rahul Dravid. Those of you who follow cricket would actually agree with me that he's been a really inspiring figure. So what I want to take you to is a few years, you know, after he had just made his test debut and he had been asked to give, he was essentially forced out of the one day team. That was the time when he actually went and really analyzed his game, including even analysis of his sweat and how he needs to essentially maintain his stamina and fitness during the one day game, changed, remodeled his game and then came out essentially, you know, came out as someone who was a phenomenal one day player, somebody who scored close to 10,000 runs. Now, what I want to explain here is, think about a Rahul Dravid without the money to have all this analysis done. So what was the happiness, what, ha what gives Rahul Dravid happiness? What gave Rahul Dravid immense happiness was succeeding as a cricketer, making sure that his full potential as a cricketer was realized. And my position is that without the money that he had, at that point in time, to hire the best coaches who could tell him his weaknesses, the fact that he was essentially playing the ball very, you know, with hard hands, and being able to tell him how he could improve his stamina, his fitness. I don't think he would have been the cricketer that he eventually was and derived the happiness that he eventually did by being one of the best number threes ever and being one of the best one day cricketers ever as well with more than 10,000 runs. So my position there is that without the money, he wouldn't have been able to pursue the happiness that came from being the best cricketer that he could have become. The second example I want to give is someone who may, you may, some of you may not have heard about, but an equally influential figure, at least for me, the person called Goenka. Goenka is actually someone who, who taught Vipassana, meditation, Vipassana, and you know, Raj knows about him as well. <laughs> what is <laughs> Um, and I want you to actually humor me for just 30 seconds, 40 seconds to tell you about how important money was in his life. Here was a guru who was teaching the ultimate method of becoming happy, meditation. And this person, before he started teaching meditation, in about his 20, you know, late 20s and 30s, had achieved the pinnacle that he could achieve in terms of status, money, etc. And then, you know, started getting afflicted with, with, with headaches, um, severe migraine headaches, and then discovered uh, meditation, Vipassana meditation. In one of the lectures, when you go for, the, for this uh, session on Vipassana, he says that, you know, it was quite important for him to have achieved money and status in life, to realize that money doesn't give him, just, just money doesn't give him happiness. 
But again, what is critical there, he states that without having gone through that phase, when he got the money and all the, the, the perks and privileges that come as part of being a moneyed man, he wouldn't have ever dreamt of essentially going into spiritual progress or meditation. Again, some, you know, a person who essentially acknowledges that without the money, his pursuit of happiness, in this case, in Goenkaji's case, pursuit of happiness for him was progressing spiritually and achieving happiness. Without money, again, having achieved and seen money, and the fact that money cannot give you full happiness, there's something else that is needed as well, he wouldn't have been able to essentially go and pursue what his, what his passion was. So again, two examples I want to essentially illustrate and show that money is something that is absolute sin for non. Leave out a few people who actually might be ascetics or saints. Money is something that you need to become happy. Now, it is nobody's position that money is sufficient to give you happiness. I'm not going to claim that either. But money is something that you need. The reason you guys are here in business school is because you want money. <laughs> Tell me one person here who doesn't want a good job. And I hear about so many stories where you actually, maybe all of you, are, and Raj must have done this himself. <laughs> Just look for a job that I think that paid him more. And you know, as it turned out, actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the privilege now of sharing our conversations as we are walking in. <laughs> So Raj was sharing. Very what? Yeah. Raj was sharing that it's nice being a business school professor because the money is good. <laughs> and that it enables him to pursue what is happiness for him, research on happiness. <laughs> With the money. And that's what she was saying. You know, she also enjoys the package that comes, and I, I'll, I'll be honest as well. If I have to go and become, you know, a, a professor of this in mathematics, maybe I wouldn't have been as happy. <laughs> so, but the position that I essentially want to claim is that money is something that is absolutely necessary for to become happiness. Now, a little bit more serious note, and this is where I'm sort of maybe I'm playing Raj's position here a little bit. But money is something which is certainly not sufficient to give you happiness. And therefore, what I want to say is you need values. You know, in images, many times actually, particularly those that have passed to us through, through sort of generations, some of these mystic images have, have, have sort of a value to them. If you, you know, I just want to remind you actually of them. You must have seen the photograph of, of uh, Goddess Lakshmi and this photograph of Goddess Saraswati. Have you ever wondered why Goddess Lakshmi always stands and Saraswati always sits? Well, my take is that money is something that comes and goes, transient, but value is something that essentially stays, knowledge, conveyed by, by Goddess Saraswati. So, once knowledge comes, once knowledge comes, it cannot be, it cannot be hand out. All this pursuit of, you know, black, black money or still bank account, that kind, there's nothing black about knowledge. They can be possibly black about money, but the important point is that you need something which is actually a lot more enduring, a lot more endearing to achieve something that will last you for life, that is happiness, and that is where values are absolutely important, the values that we talk about, and that is something that stays. Okay? But I am going to again uh, sort of conclude my position that money is something that is absolutely necessary. Without money, you cannot have a happiness. And I just want to actually point out a couple of pieces of research which I think are, are, are quite important. Daniel Kahneman, you know, whom you know, actually won the Nobel Prize for, for, for you know, behavioral economics. Uh, and, and another person who's actually sort of supposed to be the father of hedonic pricing, Angus Deaton, wrote a paper in, in 2010, and I just want to read from their abstract something that I actually discovered. Low income exacerbates the emotional pain associated with such misfortunes as divorce, ill health, and being alone. So the key words to note is low income, Exacerbates misfortune. <laughs> and low income is associated with low evaluation of one's life and emotional well being. Again, something that is important. So, in other words, if you are poor, you're less likely to see yourself as having been, having achieved something in life. And finally, and this is something which actually is a question about measuring happiness that I want to pose to Raj. There was a study that was done across the 50 states in the US. And what they found was that if you are a person in Mississippi, 
that any rupee, that any dollar that you earn more than six to six thousand dollars, and I'll be done in thirty seconds. <laughs> if you earn more than a dollar, if you earn more than a dollar about six to six thousand, it doesn't give you any happiness. But that same threshold for Hawaii is one twenty two thousand. Same country, two states in the same country. Mississippi is 66,000, Hawaii 122,000, by the way, New York is 100,000. Two different, you know, happiness, what you need for happiness is very different. Money is the same, but your, you know, your level of happiness is very different. It's relative. Happiness is relative. You know, I, you guys will feel happy when you get a job in McKinsey, but someone who's outside will be you just happy to come and become a student at ISP. Thank you. Summed up, it's relative, it depends. I think this is a phrase that all of you heard very frequently. <laughs> so it shouldn't come as a surprise to you. I'm going to now turn the stage to Professor Raj. We've been privy to some of your private conversations about business school professors who need a lot of money. I have to say, you are dressed a little bit more like Mr. Money than you are like Mr. Happiness. <laughs> With that being said, uh, putting our biases aside, Professor Raj, Mr. Happy, you take the floor now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very uh, happy that you ended with uh, low income people being miserable. How many of you guys think that you're going to be low income? Let's face it, guys. You guys are going to earn more than enough, okay? And uh, so, uh, just for the purpose, I'm going to change like we're ready to move on from money to happiness. Um, at very low levels, I agree, money is very important. But beyond the level, my level is certainly and your level too. <laughs> okay. So let me set up my case with GF for GNH with uh, starting with Aristotle's uh, famous uh, quote. Uh, Back in the day, he said that uh, happiness is the greatest good. What he meant by that is that uh, everything that we do ultimately is so that we can lead a happier, more fulfilling life. Right? I mean, in our own land of India, we know the story of Buddha, who famously left his kingdom and riches to pursue happiness. Right? So, not just among the Greeks and Buddhists, but uh, certainly among the Hindus as well. If you think about any shloka, it ends with uh, an emotional statement: Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Doesn't come up, um, end with Om Mani Murmani. Mani was in fact more important to us. I think that's how we would have ended. It seems like money is very important, not just for kings and philosophers, but for common people as well. A lot of research showing, as a recent paper in uh, 2012, across 100,000 people around the world, from farmers to CEOs, the most important goal emerged as habits. Okay? Now, you might wonder why then uh, did uh, countries and states make uh, GNH uh, the important metric by which to assess the progress of society? I think there were two big uh, reasons for it. One of which was an assumption along the lines of what I think Subhu was making that more money equals more happiness. Okay? Uh, of course, Subhu was uh, trying to acknowledge that beyond a certain limit, it doesn't um, uh, enhance happiness levels, and that's been found over and over and over again. But um, still, uh, the idea was that the more money you make, the happier you'll be, and therefore, why not that happens? And the second issue also, which Subhu mentioned, which is that happiness is maybe a difficult measure. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, both of those are not to really be true. Okay? Um, Subhu already alluded to the fact that the more money doesn't give you happiness after a certain level. And after that level, certainly it does then, no doubt about it. Um, that's why I said that GDP is not totally useless. It's like the cassette player, which has its use. It's over now. Okay? <laughs> Um, so, the second point of uh, happiness being uh, not measurable, it turns out that it's very eminently measurable. In fact, it's so much easier to measure than it was originally thought. Uh, people thought that happiness was difficult to define as subjective, it varies by people, and therefore it might be very difficult to measure. It turns out that all you need to do is ask them a simple self-report measure, how happy are you, right, on a certain point scale. That measure is highly correlated with dopamine and serotonin levels in the bloodstream, which are your <coughs> An objective measure of happiness is very highly correlated with uh, images of brain scan. Uh, the neocortex lights up when you're happy, and it turns out that that's very highly correlated with it. It's highly correlated with the attitudes and behaviors that happy people generally display. They laugh more for jokes, for example, right? They're more generous with their money, for example. 
for example. Uh, it's also very highly correlated with what other people say how happy this person is. Right? So it's triangulating evidence that's a very easy way to measure. Given that it's important, given that it's easy to measure, it would be a no-brainer to use DNS instead of GDP. Now, one of the skeptics question whether happiness, um, making happiness a uh, more important goal would lower the level of productivity that people might have. You know, happy people are lazy perhaps, you know, they're just you know, smoking away. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that's not necessarily true. Uh, there's a couple of books that have come out. One of them is called Happiness Advantage by a guy called Sean Aker, who used to, along with an award-winning teacher in Harvard called Tar Ben Shahar, used to teach a course on happiness. Uh, it turns out that across a slew of uh, different variables, happy people are better. Happy people are more productive, more creative, uh, liable to take less leave, have greater camaraderie, uh, people like to hang out with happy people, etc. So you're much better off hiring happy people than not hiring happy people. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> another concern that some people might have uh, with uh, happy people is that uh, maybe they become too soft. Right? Uh, that uh, they, they won't stand up for their rights. Or, you know, if uh, India is full of happy people, maybe you'd like Pakistan take over, or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't that's not true, right? I mean, if you think about, think of the big stone wars uh, of, of, uh, on, on the world stage in the last uh, 100 years, um, or 50 years, which is tiny by Nelson Gandhi, right? Who got freedom from India. Nelson Mandela, who stood up against the apartheid, right? and uh, Martin Luther King, right? For civil rights. I mean, you can't think of stronger people, actually. Uh, and they were very happy how they represented this idea of inner peace, okay, which is what I mean by happiness. Um, a final argument that could be made against uh, happiness is that if people are pursuing happiness, then maybe they won't be like productive and uh, uh, work in industries that uh, uh, cause misery for other people. Yeah, true. They wouldn't do that. So maybe they wouldn't work for cigarette manufacturing companies. Maybe they wouldn't be as willing to work on um, fast food chains that are making everybody obese. But if the productivity goes down as a result of those kinds of activities coming down, I think it's all the better for the current state of the world. I don't think anybody would disagree that we have lots of problems that we face collectively as a humankind. I'm just going to name four. There's a really nice book called Commonwealth by a guy called Jeffrey Sachs. It talks about eight problems. Uh, four of those problems are global warming. I don't think anybody would deny that that's part of our climate change as it's referred to now. Um, <clears throat> income inequality, uh, pollution of waterways, and uh, uh, finally, decimation of species. Uh, the current population of fish in the oceans around the world is only 20% of its equilibrium state. In many places, the fish are completely out. You know, the, the species that used to exist are gone. Right? Uh, Bluefin tuna, for example, is so low that people are prevented from fishing for it, even though um, people do do it. Okay. To summarize, uh, I want to say that um, there might be historical reasons for why happiness was not used, but it turns out that each one of those reasons no longer is valid, namely that. Happiness uh, was thought to be equated to money. It turns out that's not true. You don't um, even um, super acknowledge any values or other things um, other than happiness. Secondly, happiness was, was thought to be a difficult measure. It turns out that's not true. Thirdly, you might think that happiness is going to reduce certain kinds of good behaviors. It turns out that's not true either. Therefore, happiness is. So what we'll do for the next about uh, 15 minutes or so is that we're going to let the professors go head to head with each other. Just to summarize. <laughs> 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 Just to summarize, so we had Professor Subhu telling us that uh, fiscal security is, is a necessity. And it makes sense from the, con from the prospects of things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need to secure some of your basic fiscal and your physical needs before you can move on to self-attainment and self-actualization. On the other hand, we heard Professor Raj talking about the fact that uh, she's you know, dispelling a lot of the myths that people have surrounding happiness, that it's not objective, that it can't be quantified, that leads to things like complacency and so on. So I'd like both of you, why don't we start with you, Professor Sugu, uh, to talk about some of the points that Raj had done. Uh, uh, so uh, this is an adult audience, right? <laughs> How many of you watch pornography? <laughs> By the very fact that only two hands went up, <laughs> maybe ten, I've highlighted one of the problems of surveys. <laughs> problem when you ask someone, you know, is he happy or not? <laughs> second, second, again, 
continuing on that pornographic stuff. <laughs> How many of you can define pornography for me? Can we just tell us? Yeah. <laughs> so if, you know, I can let we can actually keep defining this concept, or take a concept like let's take terrorism. You know, when when we see an activity, a terrorist activity, we know it is terrorism. Similarly, when you go to a website which is pornographic, you know it is pornography. But when you are asked to define or measure pornography or measure terrorism, you have a big problem. Similarly with happiness, you know when a person is happy or he's not happy. But when you have to measure a person's happiness, it's a completely different ball, ball game altogether. And why do, I, why, do we, you know, why do we care about measurement? So Raj talked about productivity. Productivity and you know in economics uh, and, and in other business areas we talk about incentives. One of the key things about incentives is when you incentivize someone to perform better, implicit in that is that you have to measure. You have to measure progress or improvement. You have to give incentives for progress. Now let me ask you the following question. Yesterday when I gave you the CCN exam, <laughs> One and a half hours into the exam, many of you who had six or eight would have said, I'm not happy. <laughs> but now, with the exam having been done, and ILS and other stuff there, many of you will say, you are happy. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, whether or not a person is happy depends on the time when you ask the question as well. Apart from the fact that the question itself may be answered, you know, in the way we saw just now, right? So if I ask a person just after a person has got divorced, or if you ask a person just after he's lost someone who's actually close to him, chances are that he's going to say he's not happy. On the other hand, if you're going to ask someone who's just, let's say, gotten engaged or has just met his first love, chances are he's going to say he's happy. Okay. Now, in other words, the frame that you use, the frame of reference that you use, the time that you, the frame of reference that I'm talking about here is time that you use to measure is quite important when you're talking about happiness. Now, when you cannot measure something you know, accurately, how do you use that to incentivize? How do you create incentives? And one of the basic things that economics teaches us is that in order for to get someone to be productive, you have to provide the right incentives. So if you incentivize based on gross national, national happiness or some you know, artifact of that, some derivative of that, then what you might have is someone who's actually working very hard when he is engaged to someone and stops after you know, he gets divorced. <laughs> is that how you create a country that's going to be more productive? Uh, Rishti spoke about the fact that, you know... Uh, hang on, so yeah. very quickly, I mean, uh, how long will he continue to talk? Yeah. <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I should let you respond now. <laughs> so, I would say two uh, uh, arguments uh, against happiness. Uh, one of those is that, uh, directly asking people for happiness levels, Maybe this reading. Um, it seems from your example that people might, might lie about happiness. I'm not sure that they will. Uh, clearly, they would lie about pornography. Um, uh, I, I, that's, that's obvious. Um, but uh, even if people were to lie about happiness, or I think the more likely um, possibility is that people may not have access to how happy they are. Um, it turns out that, therefore, uh, for, for those kinds of circumstances, then you can actually use fMRI, right? Even for pornography, I'm sure that if I were to take a brain scan of you guys, I could detect uh, which of you was into it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, with, with regard to the other uh, issue that you brought up, um, which is that hackers' uh, 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 levels could be you over time. Um, now, your bank balance right now, I imagine it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> now, if you have you graduate and you have a job, it's going to be pretty high. Okay, and just because it's going to vary across time doesn't mean that you can't, it's not a valid measure. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, now, it turns out that uh, there are ways of getting around it. And actually, I mean, I do have to acknowledge that with happiness, the uh, variability might be a little bit more uh, than it might be with uh, bank balances. Uh, it turns out uh, Danny Fan, who you mentioned, has a um, method, a pioneer method called the ADA reconstruction method. Um, in which he asked people to look back on the previous day and then hour by hour go through all the things that they went through and how happy they were doing various things. And it turns out 
uh, just for FYI, are commuting is something that people absolutely hate. Okay? And it also turns out that hanging out with kids is something that on average is more unpleasant than it's pleasant. <laughs> From this being a reconstruction letter, and I won't give you any prizes for guessing uh, which of the really happiest activities. It's not working for all the very close to it. So, um, and it turns out that uh, there's a uh, huge amount of longitudinal sterility across people in how happy they are. Um, so neither of those two are really uh, is a big um, problem with regard to DNA. And uh, I, I'd like to conclude, and then and then I ask you a question myself. Okay, I'd like to conclude by stating that um, the only country that's adopted DNA officially is Bhutan. Uh, they adopted in 19 sorry in 2008 officially. Uh, 1972, the then king who took over at the age of 17, okay, Jigme Singye Wonshuk, uh, proposed DNA as the measure of progress of the country. Uh, very, very far thinking of him at that point. And uh, now, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, UK has adopted it. Uh, and uh, in December, Cameron White uh, is going to make a talk um, about uh, what results show. Uh, France is uh, on the verge of adopting it. Singapore has adopted some positive measure of happiness. Halifax has always had it uh, for a very long time, but Canada is probably going to adopt it. Okay? Just showing that the trend is for countries to start adopting this measure of happiness. And therefore, um, given that it exists, and given that, in fact, Bhutan is not only adopted, it's done terrifically well. I don't know if you can uh, guess what the GDP of Bhutan has been uh, from 1996 to now. Just uh, throw out a number. Yes. On average, 8%. Okay, bro. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not going really badly at all. And it turns out, you know, I, as I said some time back, money is important. No doubt about it. But money is subservient to happiness. And therefore, when you measure happiness, and when you target happiness, and when you, when you want to um, increase happiness levels, money will automatically fall. Okay? And uh, one of the four pillars that Bhutan uses is money. Okay? But they use money in a they measure slightly differently than I think most other countries. Two other countries blindly measure GDP. And therefore, for example, um, if uh, there has been uh, an oil spill in uh, uh, Alaska, uh, which happened uh, some years back, right? Um, the GDP might actually go up. It went up 530 percent um, when the oil spill happened. When the tsunami happened on the east coast of India, GDP went up. You know, but people weren't happy, right? Because those are negative events. Just because there's economic activity it doesn't mean that the people are happy, right? So that's the problem with GDP is that it measures pure economic growth. It subservient to happiness. <laughs> I want to ask you so. And, and you know, I do agree that by and large, for most of us, back in East speaking, it is true that happens uh, money is important for being happy. But um, when people are focused on money, studies show, uh, and metaphorically, GDP represents money and therefore represents materialism, therefore represents productivity, and all that. Uh, studies are showing, I don't know if you're aware of it, though, but the mere exposure to dollar bills makes people meaner. I don't know if you've seen this study. Uh, the mere exposure to dollar bills makes people more unethical. Rich, richer people are on average are more unethical than poorer people. I don't know if you know this. They are meaner to other people than poorer people are. Okay. Um, and G, uh, GNH, uh, you know, as a metaphor, represents more the idea of inner growth, uh, more the idea of finding something that you find uh, fulfilling and meaningful within you. And that represents a different path. It represents the path of connectivity among people. It represents uh, the idea of seeking fulfillment and what is called flow activities and pursuing a passion. And uh, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on um, how uh, the, the uh, uh, savings of GDP uh, might actually cause negative effects, and uh, what your thoughts might be on uh, whether that in fact is something you agree to. Sure. Actually, Raj, I think my position is sort of, though I'm posturing here differently, um, is closer to what you are stating as well. And I started by saying that you know, you, money plus values is what happens. Oh. So my position has only been that money is necessary for, for happiness. Um, but the bigger problem that I've had, you know, in my own um, sort of trying to build it in my head is how do you measure and use that for productive activity. Um, and I completely agree with you that you know GDP, or in particular this sort of sometimes mindless pursuit of consumerist 
as aspects can lead to aspect, you know sort of what are called what economists think about as negative externalities. Um, and the oil spill that you talk about, or pollution that you talk about, these are all aspects that are essentially negative externalities. Now, uh, again, this is something where economics, and you know certainly, is, I, I don't think I should be telling you, um, economics has done a lot of work in where you try and internalize externalities. Once you price the externality that is created in a correct manner, and I, I, you know, I'm going to acknowledge that it is difficult, I'm not going to deny it is not, but when you price the externality, then you actually get behavior that is closer to optimal, first best, uh, which you do not get when you do not price the, the, the externality. And so whether you're talking about stuff like you know oil spills or the fact that there is pursuit of economic growth at the cost of, let's say, global warming, if you think about the reason that many countries are coming together, why you have a G20 conference, is essentially because you have the problem of commons. You know, when you have a problem of commons, you create this externality. My pet example is when you have a, you know, an, a, a, a village and let's say uh, where there's a pond. If that pond is going to, that has a certain amount of fish, if every person goes and picks up a particular one fish every day, then the pond will sustain and people will have fish forever. But then the problem that you have is when every family goes, goes and picks up two fish, and therefore the fish do not regenerate, and, and that's the externality that gets created. These are all, you know, these arise because of problem of commons. When you bring coordination to ensure that problem of commons do not happen, and we see several examples of those traffic lights are essentially an example of trying to get over this problem of commons. But when you try and bring in coordination, you can actually avoid these problems. You know, G20 summit on global warming is an example of that, and, and trying to ensure that there are price, or for example, carbon tax is another example of trying to internalize or price that externality. So I'm going to essentially contend that you have a better measure with, with, with something like money, because it's very hard to incentivize based on happiness. If you know, but the externalities that get created, so you know, when, when you pursue uh, GDP at the cost of, let's say, happiness, those externalities, it's better to try and bring it into the GDP framework and have it priced rather than go to something that is a lot, lot harder to measure. That, that is essentially my stated position because you need incentives to, to make people productive. And, you know, incentives mean measurement as well in a reliable manner, not in a, people can talk about biases, etc. When you, you know, with, 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 with money, it's very hard to actually sort of talk about bias, you know, obvious biases. But with happiness, you actually, it's difficult to measure. And that's why my position would be that it's something necessary but not sufficient. I have a question. Uh, based on what uh, Professor Subhu has been talking about, this idea of measurement, uh, just like we know there's something like intelligence, there's no one form of intelligence. Could it be, perhaps we can see this rift that there is, is there more than one type of happiness? Perhaps when we break down what happiness means, that certain components of happiness are very positively correlated with physical security, and other parts aren't. What do you think about that, Professor uh, Raj? Um, so certain types of happiness are correlated with physical... Do you think it could be very positively correlated with fiscal responsibility? Other things, okay. maybe like emotional well-being, we might not see any relationship. Right. Uh, so first, let me uh, talk about what uh, Subhu said. Uh, after we hugged, I, I couldn't figure what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> that was the point of the hugging. <laughs> And therefore, uh, I just want to say uh, uh, thank you for whatever you said. Uh, <laughs> I think it was good. <laughs> Should I restate it? Uh, maybe, 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 uh, you just ask them, uh, think back on an event that made you happy, and uh, recount what happened, and uh, you can content analyze what they what they said. And it turns out, among any types of you guys, uh, over thirty percent of the people come up with uh, something that's known as a hubristic pride, which is that I achieved um, a, a great job that nobody has got, or you know, I had that a girl that everybody else was after, or I watched a pornography that nobody else could have access to. Okay. <laughs> So there's a, if this is relevant to superior, you would go for somebody else that association of happiness. Um, a bigger proportion, over 40% associated with uh, what's called connectivity, uh, namely that they went back uh, home for Diwali, for example, or Thanksgiving in the US, um, or even connectivity with an instrument as playing the guitar, uh, or with a sunset or whatever, right? Um, and uh, this other set of people who are associated with something different, like just sensory pleasure, um, that I don't know, I. Um, 
I had a great evening with my friends, I had a lot of nice food and you know, things to drink and so on. Now it turns out that each of these has its own qualities associated with it. Uh, in particular, in terms of sustainability, um, pride is not very sustainable. Uh, pride comes um, for all these people reasons. Because when you are truly high in pride, uh, the metrics on which you measure pride uh, turn out to be money and pain and power, you don't know. Um, like when you read a quote of uh, Lucky Nash, right? Um, whereas the panic really lasts longer. And then uh, there's uh, very few people who define it in terms of what um, might be called abundance, uh, which is the state of I have everything I need. Okay? I don't, I'm here to serve because my, uh, my cup of happiness is already overflowing. And the people who define happiness that way uh, end up being the happiest uh, and are able to sustain it for long. And by the way, as an asterisk that you add here, that sometimes money is not that important to reach the state of abundance. The world's happiest man, as he's called, is the guy from Matthew Ricard, who stays up in the Himalayas. He's a, a Buddhist monk of French origin, and uh, he lives in a uh, little shack that is four feet by four feet. That's it. He doesn't have any possessions. Um, and he's given a TED talk, by the way, if you guys are interested in this topic, you can go take a look at it. Um, so it turns out that uh, depending on how you associate, uh, what you associate with happiness, how you define it, um, it can have a variety of effects on the uh, longevity of it, on your behaviors, and attitudes, and so on. And I have no doubt <coughs> that the people who associate happiness with sensory pleasure will be much less likely to exhibit the kind of positive qualities that I talked about earlier, namely that they will be more productive, more creative, take less sick and all that. In fact, uh, the pursuit of uh, hedonic pleasures, as it's called, is very highly associated with suicidal thoughts. So the guy, uh, you know, to people up here, the only thing you're doing up here is drinking and smoking pot, uh, you're probably not uh, onto a happy path. Okay. Um, but if you're also doing other things, um, in addition to that, like a daily school class and uh, learning value, then uh, chances are that your happiness is going to be sustainable and you're going to show all this productive energy. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so I just have a question. Rishi, I just have a question for Raj. Um, so, this guy that you talked about, Matthew, right? You know, isn't he the outlier that we remove in a regression? <laughs> and how much of policy can be, you know, created based on outliers versus the average? But I should also say that Ram and Ram himself is an outlier. <laughs> Of course, people are going to think they need money in order to be happy. If you have another culture like Bhutan, where right. people say you don't need money in order to be happy, you're going to see more of happy results. Okay? Right. And uh, so it's not a case of human nature as set, it's a case of human nature as a range of possibilities. And the particular possibility that it displays depends on the context in which uh, you are happy. But I think that's the basic problem itself, right? That the, you know, happiness you know, both measurement and how happy you are itself is a function of the peer group that you are in. So there are research studies that show, for example, you know, in the US, African Americans, when they live in a neighborhood that's a lot more posh, are supposed to are more likely to go and buy a sports car and sort of luxury goods than if they're going to stay, let's say, in the outskirts of the city. Um, and, and that's the, the behavior itself is driven by the peer group that you essentially measure against. Um, so, you know, and, and what you're telling me then is it has both way causation, that it actually makes you behave possibly in a way that sort of makes you pursue hedonic pleasures. On the other hand, if you have, you know, a, a, a group of people who actually doesn't go after hedonic pleasures again, then you might do it less. So in other words, how do you, how do you move from an equilibrium where people just go after sensual pleasures versus an equilibrium where the people are actually not after hedonic pleasures. And that is where, you know, how do you move, let's say, take a country like, like, like India today, you know, with a lot of youngsters who might, you know, want to sort of go and pursue sensual pleasures and make them go towards, let's say, some of the bigger pleasures that you're talking about. I, I think uh, the big change that will make a big difference is the change from GDP to GDP. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> Very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. This talk on time back, and you agree that materialism drives people to analytical behavior, to consumerism, and all that. And we're talking there about analytical behavior and consumerism. But at the same time, it doesn't create the right incentives. Well. I mentioned that you can't measure it, you can't incentivize it. No, you can't measure it. I already told you that there's a bit. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
is open up questions to the audience for both the speakers or either of the speakers. So I will start if anybody has a question. We'll start with your questions. Uh, if it's addressed to both, please let us know. If it's to a particular professor. Uh, so this question is to both the professor. <laughs> <laughs> this question is to both the professors. Both of you are speaking. Um, one is money is important, and one is happiness. Is I think a lot of us feel that both are important. But the question is, we talk about values driving life, and nobody talks about money driving life and stuff like that. So, my question is, why are we seeing this? Good question. The idea is money plus values is happiness. And happiness. Why are you? The question is: Can you see them separately? They all, they always go together. Happiness, money, these values always go together. Can we say that money is always more important than that? That's my question. Can we see them separately? <laughs> I'm going to say that you have to actually, in order to be happy, you need both money and values. You know, the, the best, take examples of, you know, take Subrata Roy, or take, uh, you know, Jamalim Garaj or Satyam, right? I mean, they're actually in, 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 in prisons, so they have a lot of money, certainly, but maybe they didn't pursue values, and therefore they're not happy. So, you know, you, money is transient, values are something that are actually a lot more permanent, if you want to be happy, you know, at, at a permanent level, a reasonably permanent level, you have to have something you, that, that is more permanent. Using something that is transient, like money which keep, comes and goes, you cannot achieve something that is a lot more permanent that you're seeking. So you need values for sure. That's my stated position. That, but, but without money, you can't get that either. You know, the, the, that, so it's, money, is, money is necessary, but not sufficient for happiness. Are you saying, if I understand your question correctly, are you saying that money is the same as happiness? Uh, or the money and happiness always go together? By that you mean that if you don't have money, you can't be happy, if you have more money, you more happiness, so on? Okay. What do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, so, I, for me, sometimes I get told you that uh, findings have shown that above a certain level, there is a separation between money and happiness. In the sense that up to $75,000 per household in the United States, money and happiness go together, in the sense that there is a strong correlation between the two. But after the $75,000 mark, in the US and about 35,000 pounds in the UK, um, more money doesn't necessarily mean more happiness. So money can keep going up, happiness will stay flat. They don't go together. Does this help? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, more seriously, what, what Raj is saying is particular for all of you because you're already in the 75,000 plus category. And so for me, for you all, that's fine, that's fine. If you guys you know, gain something more out of than just having fun over here, so, uh, you know, you need something more than money. Money is important, but you need something more than money values to be happy. Uh, uh, well, one thing I want to add to that, okay, um, is that uh, while I generally agree that for most people, particularly in a context of uh, materialism, people assume that a certain amount of money is very, very important. I want to warn you that if you fall into the mindset that more money is going to make you more happy, then you never reach that position of feeling abundant. Okay. There's something to really, really soak in. Because you can get all this rat race on this treadmill and think that you need more only to get the next million you're going to be happy. There was a study done recently where people were asked, how much more money would you need in order to go from about 7.0, and it happens to us that, to uh, 9.0 or 10.0 scale. And a billionaire said three times more. A millionaire said three times more. A hundred billionaire said three times more. Everybody thinks that a little more money is going to get that, right? But it's not true because there is somebody who's got that amount of money and he's not happy. And to the extent that you similar to them, chances are that you're not going to be happy either, right? So at some point, you're going to have to start getting abundant. And that point is not clear what that point is, okay? It depends on your internal level of security, right? Above a certain amount of money, you can't buy basic business fees, right? I mean, you already have enough. So you're going to have to decide that I'm already abundant. And the earlier you hit that point, the better off you're going to be. In fact, you're going to be more successful then. Right. So that's true for you guys, but you actually you have to remember that you are one percent minority in, in a population of ninety nine percent actually where money indeed correlates with happiness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is for Professor Raj. Uh, you mentioned that Nelson Mandela is one of the strong personalities who is very happy, but no, no, uh, not happy. Then uh, I very strong. 
very strong, a very strong personality. No, no, no. And I, I mean, the only part of the time he was very aggressive and, uh, you know, uh, uh, arsonist and so on. Mm -hmm. But after he went to uh, prison, he yeah. turned uh, more pacifist. Correct. Uh, but uh, three examples that you've given, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and Martin Luther King, I think they were able to provide a lot of social good and they were able to derive happiness from that. But uh, when their personal life was concerned, it was in shambles. So what's your take on that? And how do we really define happiness? Because it's a combination of connected happiness. something over the others and then it keeps going when he's looking at connectivity and third and he's sort of an instrument in that internal happiness. So my take is if you let's say take the example of all the people who have achieved a lot in their lives, for instance Steve Jobs, he's creating an impact in the world. He's created an impact in the world and the kind of happiness he derives out of it is valued by the amount of money he can generate out of that happiness, out of that impact he's created on the world. So my question is twofold. One, why do we say that the people who are backing on achievement to see as a sense of happiness in them, the lowest, because those are the people who are creating the most impact. And secondly, don't you think that the uh, uh, the sense of impact they're creating, uh, because of which money is linked to the happiness, and that's why, uh, I mean, isn't money linked to the happiness in that aspect? So, um, I, I have a, you know, uh, a longish potential answer to give that uh, particular question. Okay, let me just take uh, the first thing, which is that uh, there are two kinds of pride that comes out. One is called hubristic pride, the other is called authentic pride. Hubristic pride is when you derive a sense of uh, happiness from comparing yourself to somebody who is inferior to you. Authentic is when you compare yourself to what you were before and you perceive a sense of progress and mastery, towards mastery. Okay. Authentic pride is the better of the two prides, but even that is not as good as a sense of um, gratitude. It turns out. Um, and the people who make the biggest contributions, and Steve Jobs might again here be a little bit of an outlier. Um, I haven't read his autobiography by the way, but I uh, heard other people say that he was a bit of an asshole. <laughs> um, so um, he probably was somebody who uh, exhibited a lot of hubristic pride. Okay? Um, now, it turns out that by and large, the people who make the biggest contributions are the ones who um, either pursue authentic pride or a sense of gratitude and humility. Okay, um, that's one thing that I want to say. The other thing that I want to say is this whole idea of creating impact. Um, I used to be a big fan of this idea till I discovered for myself that it's nothing but 
my desire for inflating my ego. Okay? And if you look back on the progress of humankind, and uh, think about any um, major invention of creation that anybody has come, come up with, including, say, Henry Ford with, with the automobile. It's not clear uh, when you look at uh, a big picture view of the whole world, of all of humanity, uh, and particularly long-term view, that these good things that were good, quote unquote good at that time when they happened are actually good. Because in this case, um, the invention of electricity or you know, fuel and you know, all that is now leading to global warming. Right? Um, so it's not clear to me that one should pursue this idea of um, creating a big impact. Now, at the same time, it's very, very important not to be um, paralyzed and think that, well, whatever I do anyway is going to have good and bad effects, therefore, no point doing anything. And this is where I think to some extent uh, the Gita comes into the picture that do what you think is a duty, but don't worry about the consequences. Okay? And if you do do that, and if you're sincere to that, that is that you're not in it for self-aggrandizement, okay, which is the outcome that you might see, but rather you're only doing what you perceive to be your duty, you'll naturally be steered towards doing small acts of kindness. Okay? Which is what Mother Teresa said, that nobody can do great things, but everybody can do small things with great love. Okay? And that's what I think, uh, in my opinion, is the most important So let me just respond to Digvijay's question because I'm concerned for you, Digvijay. <laughs> and with all of you here, um, I think in this, you know, apart from, in outside the context of just this debate, um, I think what Raj said is actually quite pertinent. Um, I'll just share some some personal, um, you know, where, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I used to TA for Raghurajan, and he used to take us to the, to, you know, to the faculty lounge. And every time he took us, you know, it was three times, he would, each time he would say, you know, if you hit a stone, if you throw a stone here, you would hit a Nobel Laureate. And when I would be looking at him, I could see in his eyes how he wanted to be that Nobel Laureate. Now, so Raghu wants to be a Nobel Laureate, and then, you know, uh, doing my PhD, Gary Becker, who just passed away in 1992, was a Nobel Laureate. Gary Becker, whenever he would talk about, he'd actually talk about Milton Friedman as the Nobel Laureate of Nobel Laureates. Okay. Uh, talk to you know other people as well, Bob Lucas or Heckman. You know all of them would talk about you know, Milton Friedman as a Nobel laureate of Nobel laureates. Uh, of course, I didn't have the chance to talk to Milton Friedman, but if you spoke to Milton Friedman, he would have said I wanted to be a Newton or an Einstein. And maybe if you spoke to Newton or Newton or Einstein, they would have said I wanted to be like God. You know, it never ends. So that's the point I think, which is just for us as individual learnings that particularly the kind of you know, strata that we are in where more money is not necessarily going to give us more happiness. So there is a strata which is outside this campus here where definitely more money translates into more happiness. But for this particular group, that is not necessarily so. And therefore, this sort of rat race of trying to be, you know, three times as, as Raj mentioned is absolutely pertinent. I, I'll just share it from my own personal experience as well. I agree with him completely on that part. The question is to you. So you took two examples. One is uh, the negative economic effect. So my question is, if you wanted people to get out of the impact of the negative economic effect, you need somebody to respond immediately and effectively. For that, you need efficient incentive systems. In such a situation, I couldn't really believe or trust my uh, instincts on the person who is sitting in Malas and enjoying himself. So going back to Professor Subhu's point of commons, right? So I think when we as a society have to sustain ourselves, we need GDP as the core, you know, driver. I mean, if I were to follow G and H, I could have a, I could have a country with full of uh, sages and saints and nothing else. Right. Um, so for a while, here people have been saying that uh, economic assumption of incentives, without incentives, people won't work, and so on. Um, now, what is the incentive for uh, you to start an organic garden, an ISD, where the amount of money that you plow in is probably going to be three times the output that you're going to get out? And so who has joined it, by the way? I've seen it so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 
So this idea that uh, you need incentives and the incentives uh, that work are money and extrinsic rewards, I think is a false notion. Um, there's a book called Drive, which I assigned for my TAD when you used your class, in which you were a student. <laughs> Uh, the truth is that uh, this is going back to studies by DC and Ryan from the 1980s, uh, and uh, it's also been actually done with that, um, you know, and nice, uh, that uh, everybody is motivated by intrinsic things. You know, we do many, many things in our life that have nothing to do with money. Um, and uh, therefore, in fact, these ages, uh, if they are close ages, and therefore are living a life of love and compassion, will jump to the rescue of the people and they don't need to be given any money. That's my opinion. Um, so, I, I really think this idea that you need incentives and only incentives to work uh, is actually spoiling people's true desires to work on something that they truly love. And that's a wrong notion to have, I think. So I think as we close off this debate, uh, we're going to end by taking the poll of seeing which side was more persuasive. When we were talking about measurement accuracy and making sure everything is predictable and reliable, so as best I can, I'm going to use a very accurate measurement to figure out who has won this debate. What I want you to do is when I point to the particular professors, I want you to give a round of applause if in the end you're persuaded by the professors. We'll start off with Professor Sewell, uh, who is going to, who's representing the GDP side. For those of you who felt that he was the winner of the debate, let's try as accurately as possible to give a round of applause. Thank you very much for a good time.